there, and asking her to make us uh, open and inspiration to the Holy Spirit, uh, like she was open to the comings of the Word to her and to us. As we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is in thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Lord, we uh, seek your face. We want to know you more. We can't do that on our own. So we ask you to, to come to us, come with your grace, come with your light, come with your fire. Uh, to enlighten our minds and flame our, our souls with your love. Draw us into a deeper intimacy with you. And that we might share your love more profoundly with the world. We ask all this in the holy and sacred name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. seek the face of the Lord. And there are beautiful lines in the, the Psalter about that. Seek his face always. Seek always the face of the Lord. It's a big part of our life, especially prayer life, uh, to seek the face of the Lord. But also seeking him uh, in our ministry or active ministry, seeking his face in the poor. You know, like Mother Teresa. Uh, Mother Teresa too is like the, the bride going through the streets looking for her bridegroom. And she's looking for him among the poorest of the poor. Uh, and so uh, we do the same. We seek seek the Lord, uh, but we remember too that uh, He seeks us. Uh, we love because uh, He first loved us. First John chapter four. And so we seek the Lord, but that's because He first seeks us. And uh, the fact that we seek Him means His grace is already at work in our hearts, in our souls. We couldn't seek him unless he first sought us and fused his grace into our, our hearts. So um, this this class today is about how the Lord seeks us and his visitations of us, his comings to us. You know, grace is not just like this uh, state, this habitual ocean of grace we, we go through. That's kind of like Carl Rahner's um, notion of, of grace is just kind of this atmosphere that's always there. Um, you know, there is something habitual about grace and steady about it, uh, but it also, it, it comes in, it comes with greater intensities at times. There are seasonable times. There are uh, kairos. Uh, there are acceptable times. Times and seasons. Where the Lord comes with greater intensity. And St. Bernard talks a lot about these comings of the word. The comings of the Lord to us. Um, not that he's not always present, but he does come with, with greater force and intensity at times and bearing his gifts and bearing uh, more of himself to us. Uh, so this, this lecture, seeking and finding and seeking more, grace upon grace. So our search never ends, right? Because the Lord is always beyond us. <clears throat> we seek him, he seeks us. And St. Bernard, as I mentioned before, probably two-thirds of his sermons at least mention this theme, or elaborate upon it, uh, the Lord seeking us, Him coming to us, the comings and goings of, of the Word. And so, you know, this, this theme, it captures a number of things. It captures that, yeah, this seeking of the Lord, it never ends. There's a seeking and finding, and a seeking more of the Lord, because He's infinite. And this seeking just isn't our own effort, so that means it's empowered, it's enlivened by the Lord's own seeking of us, his coming uh, to us anew. And this theme of the comings and goings of the bridegroom, the comings and goings of the word, it does capture something experientially in our life of prayer. There are times of consolation, times of desolation, times where we think we feel the Lord close, times where we don't feel him close. And so it, it maps on to something experientially as well. 
the comings and goings of the bridegroom, as St. Bernard describes it and others describe it. So it's good for that reason too. It uh, highlights the need for desire in the spiritual life. Right, St. Bernard, St. John of the Cross as well. You know, when times of visitation and when it seems like the Lord leaves us, those times are to make us desire him more, to cry out. Where have you hidden, beloved, and left me moaning? You fled like the stag after wounding me. I went out calling you, but you were gone. And at the first stanza of John of the Cross, the spiritual canticle, which you know by heart by now, right? (laughs) (laughs) If not by now, by the end of the course, you will. If only by me saying it over and over again. (laughs) No, it's good to have scriptures memorized so you can kind of recall them. Pray them as you're going to bed. It's good to have beautiful uh, passages of St. John the Cross memorized. So you can uh, repeat them in prayer and you can uh, sit with them and go with them. And so, yeah, this desire we need uh, for the Lord and spiritual life and the desire that needs to be re and re-enlivened. You know, steady desire, but also one that uh, does increase here or there. And that corresponds to the comings of the Lord. Okay, and then uh, the comings and goings of the Lord. It also it highlights the uh, the loving attention we need to have for the presence of the Lord and for His comings and goings. Uh, Sermon fifty seven, which you read for today, and which we'll, we'll go through very carefully, uh, notes that so it begins um, with a, a line from the Song of Songs: "My beloved speaks to me." And then St. Bernard says, look at the ways of grace. Take note of the levels of God's graciousness, the different you know, kinds, of the various ways that God comes to us in his graciousness. Look at the ways of grace. Take note of them. And uh, so Bernard opens up that world to us uh, in a very profound way. We'll see in the Sermon 57 all the different ways uh, that he, just in this one sermon, notes that the, the bridegroom comes to us. And why do we want to know all these things? So we can be attentive to him when the Lord does come. We can be attentive to welcoming him, to cooperating with his grace, to receiving the inspirations of his grace. You know, it's again, this is really freeing us from like a practical Christian deism, which we can all tend to fall into. Uh, where it's just us seeking the Lord, it's just our activity, just our speaking. Uh, but no, you know, right? Prayer is a two-way street. It's a relationship. We speak, but God speaks. We act, but God acts on our souls. Um, we, we give, but we also receive from the Lord. And so seeing all the different ways that the Lord comes to us opens us up, makes us attentive to his comings, makes us attentive to the two-way street that prayer is, that this relationship is. So my beloved speaks to me and St. Bernard says, look at the ways of grace, right? And all these four volumes on his sermons on the Song of Songs, these 86 or 87 sermons, uh, it's all about looking at the ways of grace. And it's beautiful to do that and to take note of it all. And it says, study the devotion and study Sagas, sagas, I don't know that word, wisdom uh, of, the, of the bride. With what a vigilant eye she watches for the bridegroom's coming. And scrutinizes everything about him. He comes, he comes faster, he draws near, he is here, he looks about, he speaks. And not one of these details escapes the diligence of the alertness of the waiting bride. All right, so be awake. Be awake to all the way the Lord's, Lord's comes to us. And St. Bernard helps us to be awake to him. A little later in that sermon, um, number three, paragraph 50, I'm sorry, sermon 57, paragraph three, he says, um, Arise, make haste, my love, my dove, my beautiful one. Happy the conscience which deserves to hear these words. Who among us do you think is so vigilant? so attentive to the time of his visitation and the bridegroom's coming that he every moment scans every detail of his approach 
so that when he comes and knocks, uh, he opens the door to him right away. These words are not so applied to the church as to exclude any one of us who together are the church from a share in its blessings. So yeah, we want to be attentive to the bridegroom's coming so that we can open the door, welcome him when he knocks, and cooperate with what he's doing. So that's a line from Luke 12, 36. And that's actually a line that St. Bruno, the Carthusian, the founder of the Carthusians, in a letter, he quotes that verse uh, as to uh, what the purpose of the Carthusians is. You know, what do Carthusians do? Uh, they, they sit and wait for the coming of the bridegroom, um, attentive to him, so that when he comes and knocks, they can open up the door right away to him. That's what we're all called to. To be like St. Bruno, attentive to the knocking of the Lord so we can open the door and get, on, get in on uh, his plan of love in our souls, in our world. Uh, but we do fall asleep. And so we need someone like St. Bernard to, to wake us up to all the different ways the Lord is coming to us. Now, someone who has just kind of entered this conversation or has just begun thinking about these things is going to be like, well, how can we speak about the comings and goings of the Lord? Isn't he already present? Especially a soul in the state of grace. Uh, he's present as, as in a temple. Is he, is he leaving by grace? And what's, what's happening here? Um, and so that would be like an initial question that comes up. But of course, you students of spiritual theology, um, we had a whole semester where we talked about this, and we've spoken about it already in this class, um, or this course. So how do you respond to that? In what ways does the, the Lord come and go if he's already present? I mean, with infused contemplation, as we have spoken about, um, you don't necessarily have to feel with all of your senses that he is present with you. Um, sometimes it can appear in dryness. And, yeah, almost this, it feels like desolation when he really is the, the closest with you. Um, we've spoken about, like, a bright light that's, like, so bright that it seems like it's not even, like, he's not even present. It's so bright. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Yep, yeah, infused contemplation. He does. He comes with his grace to illumine our minds, inflame our hearts at uh, times more so than others. And he does, but that does come in different ways. It can be uh, yeah, the light that blinds us. That seems like darkness. It can seem like uh, the desolating fire that Saint Bernard will speak a little bit later on in uh, Sermon Fifty Seven. Um, and yep. I was thinking of. I don't remember what canticle it is. Oh! Uh, <laughs> Maybe 11? Yeah! <laughs> Look at this! Yeah! Wow, <laughs> stepping up. Yeah. Where he talks about the different like levels of presence. So there's like, yeah. God is present. I don't remember the name of it. It's number one. Like, like he's just present in the creation. Yeah, everywhere. His natural presence. Yeah. The and then there's another level of presence. But I'm specifically thinking of the fourth level. The third. Oh. The third. Effective presence. Yeah. It's like you feel him coming and going, and that's the coming and going. It exactly. doesn't mean that he's not, like he leaves. He's always present in one sense. But then there's another level of it. Yeah. That's a, yeah. Surely you can come up with a second level of presence. So there's a natural presence <laughs> everywhere. And then the third we could call like a mystical presence or an affective presence, a movement of charity in your heart. Um, but then, yeah, the second, you can... Is it... It's like the... Um, I'm thinking of like baptism. Exactly. Where he's then present in a more... By grace. Yeah, yeah yes, by grace. Yes. By grace. By grace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's present everywhere, uh, nature, natural presence. He's present, uh, those in the state of grace. He's present uh, as in a temple, uh, through grace. And then this third level, um, which, yeah, I wish John of the Cross had a, like a tidy little name for it, but we'll just read his description just to recall it here. Um, but yeah, good, good call. Spirit of Canto 11. <laughs> uh, yeah, she's on top of it. That's good. Um, not 
Yeah, and that's, you know, like we said before, like St. Bernard, he certainly, there are times where he, he says, yeah, the Lord's always present. Uh, but then a lot of times he's talking about the comings and goings of the Lord, and you're like, Ugh, how do I, how do we make sense of this? And so John of the Cross, um, commenting on Song of Songs as well, uh, gives us some precision to think about these things in a more theological way and systematic way. Uh, so yeah, precisely, um, stanza 11, spiritual canticle. The stanza is, reveal your presence and may the vision of your beauty be my death. For the sickness of love, the wound of love is not cured except by your very presence and image. That yearning of love is not cured except by the Lord. And so uh, stanza 11, uh, number three. Uh, it should be known that God's presence can be of three kinds. Okay, and then we won't go through this all, but yeah, this first is this natural presence. The second is this presence by grace in which he abides in the soul and is pleased and satisfied with it. And then the third presence is his presence by spiritual affection. For God usually grants his spiritual presence to devout souls in many ways by which he refreshes, delights, and gladdens them. Yeah, so he comes at times to refresh us, to delight us, to gladden us, to renew us, to restore us. So this is his third level of presence, and this is what St. Bernard is speaking of in the comings and going to the bridegroom. The third is his presence by spiritual affection, the movement of the heart, God stirring in our hearts. And what image does St. Bernard use for that? That's pretty powerful. The boil. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The pop. Yeah. And then it, when you turn it up, then it boils. Perfect. Yep. Uh, and so, yeah, so you have, um, yeah, sometimes the pot of our soul, the water of our soul boils because the Lord has come, has come with this fire. We're enlivened, we're renewed, we're strengthened. Um, Sermon 74, which is the second one we'll talk about today, uh, talks a lot about that. Um, God's renewal in the soul. The third is his presence by spiritual affection, that, that movement in our spirits. For God usually grants his spiritual presence to devout souls in many ways by which he refreshes, delights, and gladdens them. Yet these many kinds of spiritual presence, just as the others, are all hidden. Right? So we don't get that express, manifest encounter with the Lord until the next life, the beatific vision. Uh, but they're nonetheless real. But they're, they're subtle. They're hidden. That's why we have to be awake, attentive. We have to listen for the knocking of the bridegroom. And he comes as a shy lover. Uh, St. Bernard in Sermon 57 you know, speaks of that in that way. The Lord comes as a shy lover. As a very delicate presence. We can miss his presence if we're not attentive to it. Yet these many kinds of spiritual presence, just as the others, are all hidden. For in them God does not reveal himself as he is, since the conditions of this life will not allow such a manifestation. And then uh, he, he talks more about this affective presence, the third level of presence. Yet insofar as this soul is full of fervor and tender love of God. Right? We, we experience that. Sometimes our souls are more filled with fervor than other times. Because the Lord has come in a more profound way to renew us, to strengthen us. Yet insofar as the soul is full of fervor and tender love of God, we should understand that this presence she asks the Beloved to reveal refers chiefly to a certain affective presence the Beloved accords her. This presence is so sublime that the soul feels an immense hidden being from which God communicates to her some semi-clear glimpses of his divine beauty. And these bear such an effect on the soul that she ardently longs and faints with desire for what she feels hidden there in that presence. All right, she comes into contact with the mystery, a glimpse of the divine beauty. St. Basil the Great likes to speak about lightning flashes of the divine beauty. Lightning flashes of the divine beauty. In this life, it, it can be very brief, um, momentary, maybe a half hour. That's the, uh, you know, so the Gregory the Great and others, St. Bernard, this tradition, 
they take uh, a revelation book of revelation there was silence in heaven for like 30 minutes or half an hour it says and so they they say you know contemplation it normally doesn't go beyond that <laughs> uh, but you know, it could be very very brief lightning flashes of, of divine beauty and for saint bernard an important lesson is that yeah the soul is always going through changes there's always alternations in the soul uh, times of desolation times of consolation and that's important for us to come to terms with so we, we don't think something uh, wrong is happening or something bad is happening when our, our souls do fluctuate. Uh, times we feel the Lord's presence, other times we don't. That's, that's just part of it. And as Macarius the Great says, our, our soul is like the changing weather. The states of our soul is like the changing weather. And so to accept that. And to note that it's all part of God's plan. The comings and goings of the Lord. The felt comings and goings of the Lord. It's all part of God's plan. We'll see in uh, Sermon 57, it's all part of God's wisdom. Times where we don't sense his presence as, as completely. Uh, there are times to test us, to humble us. To make us yearn for more. And then we have these times of refreshment to strengthen us, to make us yearn for more as well as we, we get a, a glimpse of the Lord. So St. Bernard says in uh, Sermon 21, 21 number 10, he says, expect a twofold help from above in the course of your spiritual life. A twofold help. One, Correction or trials, number two, consolation. And note that he says both of these are helps from above. Expect a twofold help from above. Uh, consolations and trials. They're like two God, two hands of God, shaping uh, the clay that we are into his wonderful masterpiece. Expect a twofold help from above in the course of your spiritual life, correction or trials and consolation. Trials control the exterior. Consolations work within. <coughs> Correction or trials curb arrogance. Consolation inspires trust. Correction or trials beget humility. Consolation strengthens the faint-hearted. Correction makes a man discreet. Consolation makes him devout. Correction or trials imbues us with the fear of God. Consolations temper that fear with the joy of salvation. So there, there are both uh, helps from above. And to accept that, to receive that as such in faith, looking to the cross of Christ and seeing, yep, yeah, okay, this is part of it. Cross and resurrection. Right, it's like the I shared the prior of the charter house. He said the cell shows us two face. Life itself shows us two face. That of the tender mother and that of the cruel master. The cruel master. And yeah, we, we need both. We need both. Um, the tender mother and the, the cruel master. Or the later he kind of, he softened it, right, to... to um, stern master because he said uh, the cruel master was scaring novices too much <laughs> and I caught him on that I called him out I said I said you know father you when I first got here you were saying uh, cruel master now you're saying stern master <laughs> um, but yeah it's true and we, we need both and the Lord knows what we need and so um, so we receive it and we'll see in uh, Sermon 57, number 7, that one of the ways that God comes is as a devastating fire. The fire that is God does indeed devour, but it does not debase. It burns pleasantly, devastates felicitously, devastates happily or pleasantly. It is a coal of desolating fire, <clears throat> but, a, <clears throat> but a fire that rages against vices, only to produce a healing unction in the soul. 
Recognize, therefore, that the Lord is present both in the power that transforms you and in the love that inflames you. Right? And it's often through the trials uh, that the Lord is that power that transforms us. So he's present in both, present and active in both. He's a coal of desolating fire, a fire of desolation that pleasantly devastates in order to arouse and prepare you. To make you realize what you are of yourself. That afterwards you may the more sweetly relish what God's action makes of you. So these visits of the Lord, he comes out as he wants to, in the ways that he wants to. And so when we seek visits of the Lord, we're not just seeking um, joyful experience. We're not just seeking consolations. Uh, we're seeking more of the Lord. Right? So yearning for the visit of the Lord, it can be as simple as crying out, Lord, I need more of you. Lord, I need more of you. And he, um, he's the one who decides what that more of him looks like uh, that we need now. But yeah, we're after not experiences or consolations. We're after uh, the Lord. Lord, I need more of you. It's not going to happen otherwise. I'm not going to make it otherwise. It's not going to become the beautiful thing you want it to become uh, unless you, you come with a greater fullness. Lord, I need more of you. I need more of you. And when he comes, when he comes with more of himself, it's as that stealthy lover, that shy lover, the St. Bernard says. And so we have to be attentive to receive him as such when he does come in a greater fullness. Um, but not like in the beatific vision, uh, something very subtle, but nonetheless real, true. Okay, another question. Visitations of the Lord. Um, by the way, you know, I, during the homily, I spoke of like two great tests. Uh, COVID was the first test, humanity, in, the, in our time. And then the second test, maybe we're entering into now of humanity. Um, well, this is an important test too. If you're learning your spiritual theology, so you don't want to fail this one either. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I shouldn't joke about that, but um, even so, amen. Even so, amen. Um, come, Lord Jesus. Okay. Um, so this uh, talk about visitations of the Lord. Is this just St. Bernard that talks like this? I mean, is this just something unique to St. Bernard? Does this apply to all of us that the Lord visits us in these ways? Or is this just like St. Bernard's spirituality? How do you respond to that? Yeah. Are these the movements of the normal Christian life? Yep, they are. As part of the ordinary Christian life. What what catechism and what paragraph in the catechism would you like to <laughs> for this <laughs> about the mystical life? Uh, all are called to the mystical life and uh, the intimacy with the Lord. That's called mystical. Twenty fourteen. Yeah, yeah. Twenty fourteen. Um, yeah. So this is just the ordinary unfolding of Christian life for all of us. School children and their catechism classes are learning about this. <laughs> Soon they will be. We get the catechetical programs where they need to be. Uh, so, okay, yeah. So it's part of, yeah, infused contemplation, uh, the mystical life, uh, the Lord's touches. It's all part of the ordinary unfolding and full flourishing of grace in our lives. Um, so how do other saints and authors speak about these visitations of the Lord? Can you think of anyone else that comes out of them? Okay. Thomas Aquinas. Yeah, how does say breathing for love? Yep. Exactly. Yeah, so it, it's it's in uh, St. Thomas Aquinas' teachings on the invisible missions of Son and Spirit. First part of the Summa Theologiae, question forty three. It's all about the invisible missions of Son and Spirit. So the Father sent the Son and Spirit visibly into the world in the Incarnation and at Pentecost, the, the dove, the flames, 
of fire, visible missions that can be seen, the Son and Holy Spirit being sent. Uh, but after those events of salvation history, Son and Spirit continue to be sent by the Father invisibly to the soul. And St. Thomas says the visible sending of Son and Spirit were for the sake of the invisible sending of Son and Spirit. Son and Spirit um, entering more profoundly into our souls to dwell there, to come with their grace, their light, their love. And St. Thomas says, uh, Son and Spirit come in the same way that they've proceeded from the Father from all eternity. The Son comes as a word. The Holy Spirit comes as a movement of love, an impulse of love, a word breathing forth love. Or, as it shows itself in the soul, an intellectual illumination that breaks forth into the affection of charity. That's question 43, Article 5, um, response to the second objection. An intellectual illumination that breaks forth into the affection of charity. Infused contemplation is a clear example of that. Um, so yeah, so St. Thomas speaks about the same thing, visitations of the Lord, the coming, the sending of uh, Son and Spirit anew to us. And as St. Thomas points out, so okay, what does it mean for them to be sent since they are, are already there? Well, it means for them to be sent is that there's a sender, the Father, he sends. And the other thing it means is that they come to be present in a new way, in a fuller way of grace, uh, building up the, the virtues so that they come to exist in our souls in a new way when they're sent, in a fuller way. <clears throat> yeah, so we have good theology behind this. Uh, the angelic doctor and the visitations. Can anyone think of any other saints who speak about this? Yeah. It seems like we um, heard this this morning in the office from St. Augustine. Um, I haven't done office of readings yet, so you have to tell us. Tell me. Yeah, so it was from his confessions. Um, and Augustine was, he was asking the Lord basically to reveal to him his own faults and failings and saying that I I can't know them unless you reveal them to me. Um, and also asking God to just dwell in him more and more. Mm. So from that, yeah, it seems like St. Yeah. Austin is relying upon grace upon grace. Um, yeah. He, like St. Bernard says in, um, in Sermon 57 about like the threefold aspects of um, the soul at union with God is preaching, praying, and contemplating. Um, yeah, St. Augustine is asking for these and receiving from the Lord because he's desiring more and more. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, yeah, if you have ears to hear it, you, you hear it all over the place. Um, you know, certainly, yeah, St. Augustine in those ways. Um, and St. Thomas is quoting St. Augustine in that um, question 43, article 5 response to... Um, and yes, St. Augustine says the Son is sent whenever he, he is perceived by anyone. <clears throat> the Son is sent whenever he is perceived in a living way, right? No one can say Jesus Christ is Lord except uh, through the Holy Spirit. Um, so the Son is perceived whenever he, he is sent whenever he is perceived. And Aquinas notes perception uh, implies something experiential, an experiential knowledge of God. Um, experiential knowledge of God coming from wisdom. Uh, a tasting of God. Sapientia from Sapor. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's in St. Augustine in many different ways. Uh, the way I pointed out, but also the way that you pointed out. Um, <clears throat> ah, I wrote, I have this in one of these volumes here. <clears throat> yeah, this is, so this is, um, I got this from Office of Readings. <clears throat> So this is from uh, the Memorial of St. Lucy, December 13th. Um, yes, yeah, so this while I was on retreat, I guess, at the Sisters of Bethlehem, studying St. Bernard uh, <laughs> intensely uh, for that week. Uh, office of Readings for St. Lucy on December 13th. It was like, oh, wow, yeah, this is just what Bernard's speaking about, too. So St. Ambrose on Virginity writes this. More than others, you can be compared to the church, virgins, virgins. More than others, you can be compared to the church. When you are in your room, then at night, think always on Christ and wait for his coming at every moment. He enters by the open door. He has promised to come in and he cannot deceive. Embrace him 
the one you have sought. Turn to him and be enlightened. Hold him fast. Ask him not to go in haste. Beg him not to leave you. The word of God moves swiftly. Do not imagine you are displeasing to him and that this is the reason he has gone so quietly or so quickly. Do not imagine you are displeasing to him and that this is the reason he has gone so quickly. No, for he allows us to be constantly tested. Go out and seek him once more. So the same exact thing. You know, St. Bernard says he departs so that you seek him more ardently. St. John of the Cross says the same thing. Go out and seek him once more. Hold him fast by bonds of love, by spiritual reigns, by the longing of the, of the soul. If you also, like the bride, wish to hold him fast, seek him and be fearless of suffering. Whoever seeks Christ in this way and finds him can say, I held him fast and I will not let him go before I bring him to my mother's house, into the room of her who conceived me. Song of Songs quote. What is this house, this room, but the deep and secret places of your heart? Whoever seeks Christ in this way, whoever prays to Christ in this way is not abandoned by him. On the contrary, Christ comes again. Christ comes again and again to visit such a person, for he is with us until the end of the world. It's pretty good, huh? <laughs> Sounds like St. Bernard. Clairvaux. Yeah, so we're on good, solid ground here. You know, St. Catherine of Siena, too, she also speaks a lot about the visitations of the Lord. If you're engaged in vocal prayer that you're not obligated to say, and the Lord visits your, your soul, your spirit, set the vocal prayer down to attend to the visitation, to open yourself to his coming in a way beyond words. You know, that's a time where you enter into that, that silent adoration before the Lord, that silent uh, receiving of him, that silent receptivity, a simple gaze of love upon the Lord and allowing him to have his way with you. So the visits of the Lord, they're all over the place. What about St. John the Cross? That austere doctor of the church. <laughs> Does John have a place for visits with the Lord? Yes. 37.4, Spirit of Canticle 37.4. In order to reach perfection, uh, three things are needed. Much spiritual effort needs to be put forth by the soul. Uh, much spiritual suffering uh, that we have to pass through. And uh, the third thing that John Cross mentions that we need uh, to reach spiritual perfection are visitations of the Lord. One cannot reach in this life what is attainable of these mysteries of Christ and spiritual perfection without having suffered much, uh, without having undergone much spiritual activity, and without having received numerous intellectual and sensible favors from God. And the uh, visitations, the word visitations show up explicitly in a few places, but just to mention one, uh, spiritual canticle number one, which the, the first part deals with, you know, how we seek the Lord in faith, even when it seems like he's not present. And it really helps us in those times of darkness when we don't feel the Lord present, how to seek him in faith. And that's calling us to a greater faith and uh, great passages there. And then in the second half of spiritual canticle one, he turns to visits. And number 17, a spiritual canticle one. It should be known that besides the many other different kinds of visits God grants to the soul in which he wounds the soul and raises us up in love, he usually bestows some secret touches of love that pierce and wound it like fiery arrows, leaving it wholly cauterized by the fire of love. And uh, these are called wounds of love. And that's going to be next class. We'll talk about wounds of love. They so inflame the will and its affection that it burns up in this flame and fire of love. And it renews it. It, it changes it. It transforms it. Um, and then he talks about these visits are not like the others. Uh, anyway, so then he goes on to talk about visits of the Lord in this spiritual canticle one. Um, so just, yeah, just to show we're on good, solid footing here as we uh, turn to St. Bernard and think about these visits of the Lord more. 
And again, you know, seeking more of the Lord, a visit of the Lord, can be as simple as, Lord, I need more of you. Lord, I need more of you. Be that simple. That simple. And let him, you know, decide what that's going to look like. What the more is going to look like. Saint uh, Bernard then in um, sermon number nine, again, like the need to cry out for these visits of the Lord, to seek them. And again, you're seeking something within the ordinary unfolding of grace. So it's something we can all pray for. So in the early 20th century, there was a debate among spiritual theologians on whether you can pray for the grace of infused contemplation. Because you shouldn't pray for like extraordinary mystical favors like the stigmata or levitation or visions. The extraordinary you shouldn't pray for. <clears throat> but in few, So the consensus was infused contemplation you should pray for. And you can because it's part of not the extraordinary but the ordinary unfolding of grace. And we need it for perfection. Uh, you know, number three in John the Cross, you need visits of the Lord. You need uh, many intellectual and sensible favors from the Lord to reach perfection. And so it's right to ask for them, to plead for them. You know, give me deeper prayer, Lord. Give me deeper prayer. I need more of you, Lord. Draw me deeper to your heart, however you want to express it. Uh, but uh, yeah, pray for uh, these uh the grace of infused contemplation, these visits of the Lord. That's something my uh, spiritual director when I was a second year student brother uh, told me to do. I didn't know before that that you could do that or that I should do that. Um, but yeah, it's helpful to hear that from him and to uh, apply myself to, to asking for these graces. So St. Bernard, uh, Sermon 9, kind of confronts this sort of question. Um, starting at paragraph two. Okay. So he, he's talking about faithful monks, monks who have been faithful to you know the rule, faithful to the life of prayer, uh, but they, they, they yearn for more. What do they yearn for? Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Right? And that's this infused contemplation we've been speaking of. Um this a little more direct contact with the Lord um, that's experiential, that uh, kind of goes beyond words, simple words, uh, more to the reality. Um, and so, I'm well aware that he is a king who loves justice, but headlong... Okay, so I'll start a little earlier. So he's saying, you know, that the bride recognizes she's received so much from the Lord, but she says, I cannot rest unless he kisses me with the kiss of his mouth. I thank him for the kiss of the feet, right, which is contrition, compunction. I thank him too for the kiss of the hand, which is growth in virtue, him lifting us up. Uh, but if he has genuine regard for me, let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. There is no question of ingratitude on my part. It is simply that I am in love. Okay, isn't so that nice? Right, there can be a little voice in your head. You've received so much from the Lord already. You're so unworthy. How dare you ask uh, for, for more? How dare you ask him to, for a kiss of the mouth? There is no question of ingratitude on my part. It is simply that I am in love. The favors I have received are far above what I deserve, but they are less than what I long for. It is desire that drives me on. Please do not accuse me of presumption if I yield to this impulse of love. My shame indeed rebukes me, but love is stronger than all. I am well aware that he is a king who loves justice, but headlong love does not await for judgment. It is not chastened by advice, not shackled by shame, not subdued by reason. I ask, I crave, I implore, let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. Don't you see that by his grace I have been for many years now careful to lead a chaste and sober life. I concentrate on spiritual studies, resist vices, pray often. I am watchful against temptations. I recount all my years in the bitterness of my soul. As far as I can judge, I have lived among the brethren without quarrel. I have been submissive to authority, responding to the beck and call of my superior. I do not covet goods, not mine. Rather do I put both myself and my goods at the service of others. With sweat on my brow, I eat my bread. 
Yet in all these practices, there is evidence only of my fidelity, nothing of enjoyment. What can I be but in the words of prophet another Ephraim, a well-trained heifer that loves to tread the threshing floor? <laughs> okay, I'm, it's going to get better here in a second. <laughs> But yeah, you know, this is a monk who's faithful. He's, he's this heifer pressing on. He's, he's laboring. Uh, but he, he needs more. He needs more. On top of that, the gospel says that he who does no more than his duty is looked on as a useless servant. I obey the commandments to the best of my ability, I hope. But in doing so, my soul thirsts like a parched land. If therefore he is to find my holocaust acceptable, let him kiss me, I entreat, with the kiss of his mouth. And then St. Bernard says, speaking to his monks, many of you too, as I recall, you know, like in our monthly meetings, or, uh, uh, many of you too, as I recall, are accustomed to complain to me in our private conversations about a similar languor and dryness of soul, an ineptitude and dullness of mind, devoid of the power to penetrate the profound and subtle truths of God. Devoid, too, entirely, or for the most part, of the sweetness of the Spirit. What of these except that they yearn to be kissed? That they yearn is indeed evident. Their very mouths are open to inhale the Spirit of wisdom and insight. Insight that they may obtain to what they long for. Wisdom in order to savor what the soul apprehends. Yeah, so um, yeah, so it's right for these monks. Uh, it's right for us trying to live this faithful life to also cry out for these uh, deeper graces of prayer. I need more of you, Lord. Let, me, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Now, does this sound familiar? Uh, that they yearn is indeed evident. Their mouths are open to inhale the spirit of wisdom and insight, the uh, spirit of wisdom and revelation. Where is that from? What scripture uh, verse is that? May the God of our and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. You may know what is the hope of this calling, what their glorious riches and so forth. Ephesians 1, 17 through 18. Um, so this, yeah, so this it shows up in uh, St. Bernard here um, and either the sermon before or after. But anyways, in terms of this, so, you know, these visits of the Lord, this infused contemplation, it's, it's not simply the saints who talk about it, it's also the scriptures, right? And uh, St. Bernard is building on that. The spirit of wisdom and insight, spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God, having the eyes of our hearts enlightened. Uh, bringing us to that, that knowledge of him that's beyond all knowledge. That contact with him that's beyond all conceptual knowledge. The concepts help get us there, uh, but we're brought more into the mystery of the reality itself. So we, we long for these things. We pray for these things. Father, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes, yeah, please. Sorry. Pray. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. What was the Ephesians quote? So it's uh, one seventeen, uh, and, and the following what follows. So yeah, may the God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ, give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Right, so eyes, eyes not just of your mind, but eyes of the heart, uh, knowing mingled with loving, a loving knowledge, a knowing love, the eyes of the heart enlightened. And enlightened for what? Unto knowledge of him, knowledge of God, uh, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Right, we can have conceptually an idea of what the Lord is calling us to, but it really is a mystery, like what the Lord, the heights to what the Lord calls us to. And so this like tasting of that, um, that you may know what is the hope of your calling, what are the glorious riches of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power at work in us who believe. Right? Which was exercised in Christ when the Father raised him from the dead, gave him the name above every other name, and so forth. <laughs> um, and so yeah, this is so it's, it's sort of a Christ-centered knowledge of God. It's a, uh, uh, an experiential knowledge of the mystery of Christ uh, to the knowledge of God, the mystery of God as he is in himself. Um, so that's what St. Bernard's speaking about, and he's just building on the scriptures uh, with this. 
Okay, many other questions or comments? Is that yeah. also the E3 prayer? Is that inspired by this it passage? Is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's very Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I um, pray over people with the Elizabeth of the Trinity oil as well. And praying, yeah. The Lord, this is St. Paul's prayer, not just for like the monks and nuns of his, his day. <laughs> Um, it's for, um, you know, anyway, it's, it's um, but it's for everyone. It's for the church of Ephesus. He's asking for these things. And it's, they have these profound prayers. And the Lord want, must want us to ask for similar things if he puts these prayers in the scriptures to take the word of God, the inspired word of God, uh, that, you know, that, that is this prayer and to speak it back to God. He must want to answer it. And so uh, we, we call him to do that. Uh, we ask him to do that. Okay, so let's get into Sermon 57 now. <clears throat> Just going through it this time. I almost want to say like this is the best sermon of all time. <laughs> 57 or 74? 57. 57? Yeah. I mean, 74 is good, too. <laughs> um, and 74 is one of the more famous ones of St. Bernard. But I think, yeah, 57, just reading it again, just, there's so much here. Um, perhaps the best sermon of all time. You know, the Sermon of the Mount is, is better, but... St. Paul's Sermon in the Areopagus. Okay, that's probably, you know, there are probably some other ones. St. Peter's Sermon on the Day of Pentecost. Uh, but, you know, this, this is, um, this is a close second to this. <laughs> and, you know, Spiritual Canticle 1, I've said is the best, like, 12 pages, uh, in the mystical tradition that we have. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't count that as a sermon. Um, so, <laughs> so they, they don't compete in that way. Um, so, um, so yeah, the kind of, anyways. This is more treatise-like, his commentary on Scripture Canticle 1. This is, this is a sermon. Um, yeah, number 57. I added another star to it in my table of contents. Uh, so it, it's three stars rather than two, three, four. So, uh, yeah. It's big. <laughs> Well, let me ask you, um, those who have been able to read it, what, what struck you as you read it? What stood out? Sometimes in Bible study, I just feel like how stupid humanity is that we were told these things again and again and we just we disregard it, you know, the Old Testament, the stupid golden calf. Like, <laughs> don't do this, don't do this. And we've been given the New Testament, we've been given the Word of God, and yet we're stupid human beings. Unless we get some tangible thing, we don't believe it. And so I think that's why Carl Rauner said what he said, that the uh, Christian of the future is either going to be a mystic or nothing at all, because we're so stupid, we don't believe it unless we feel it. And what I got from 57 is... Yeah, he actually does come. He actually does give us these little subtle tastes of him if we're paying attention. So yeah. those of us who can grasp that, we know this is real. Like this yeah. is, and we, we can use that to fuel our, our faith. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Yeah, we have eyes to, eyes to see it and uh, to receive it. Hebrews um, 5 has an interesting thing. Um, Maybe it's number six. Um, oh, that's, uh, you know, so Hebrews Hebrews six speaks about uh, the beginning or towards the beginning. It is impossible to restore again to repentance. Okay, so it speaks about you know like the ordinary Christian, one who has been enlightened, who has tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come. Right, so that's like ordinary Christian life. I mean, in this context, he's speaking of someone who falls away from that. Um, but it, it's still like, it's astounding that, yeah, this is normal Christian life. Who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. 
And then, uh, and, and par- so keep that in mind when you hear uh, chapter 2 about the declaration of the gospel. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Then this salvation was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So how does God continue to attest to his message? Uh, Through signs and wonders, various miracles, uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. I take also to, you know, I take to mean, okay, the extra charisms but also this interior attestation, uh, which he just, you know, which we see in chapter six, uh, who have been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. That too is how the Lord attests to the message of the gospel and the reality of it uh, by his work in our interior souls, if we're open to receive it and to see it as his touch. <clears throat> So let's just get started with 57 before we uh, take our break and come back. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, just, just the, the beginning again. And all the ser- you know, a lot of the sermons of these 86 sermons are about this, but this one especially. My beloved speaks to me, look at the ways of grace. Take note of you know, all the ways that God's grace works. And study the devotion and sagacity of of the bride with with what a vigilant eye she watches for the bridegroom's coming and scrutinizes everything about him. He comes, he comes faster, he draws near, he is here, he looks about, he speaks. And not one of these details escapes the diligence or the alertness of the waiting bride. So he's going to teach us how to um, see all these different ways of grace, how to be attentive, alert to the, all the ways the Lord comes to us. He'll tell us in a Sermon 86 that to pray and to seek the word are the same thing. What does it mean uh, to pray? Well, it means to seek the word. He's speaking a lot about seeking the word and what does that mean? Is it some special thing that only special people do or is it just an activity here or there? Well, no, praying is seeking the word. And since prayer is this two-way street, uh, prayer is also the word seeking us. The word's visits to the soul are God's actions in the soul, part of this two-way street. And that's simply to pray, to seek the word and to be sought by the word. And to pray are the same thing. Yeah, we don't want to miss any encounter with the Lord and what he has for us. And so we want to learn from St. Bernard to be attentive to these things. That we can open the door uh, as soon as he comes and knocks. Then he says um, a little later, still paragraph one. Or again, he comes with love and desires to show mercy. He comes faster in his eagerness to help. He draws near by assuming our lowliness. He is here to his contemporaries. Right? And we saw that in sermon number two. And it's modeled after Origen and his commentary on the Song of Songs. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. What does that mean? Well, it means a certain directness with the Lord. A certain directness of contact with the Lord. And we have that on one level with the coming of Jesus Christ. Right, in many and various ways in the past, God spoke to our, our forefathers through the prophets. Now he has spoken to us through the Son. So let him kiss me with the kisses of, the, of his mouth. That direct contact on one level is Christ, the incarnation, coming. And then on another level, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, is that more direct contact with Christ uh, through graces of prayer, through infused contemplation, through the visitations of the Lord. So we see him kind of going through those levels again. First, he, he draws near by assuming our lowliness, right? taking our flesh. He is here uh, to his contemporaries. Uh, looks ahead to future generations. So it's not just 
uh, those in the past who had some kind of direct contact with him 2,000 years ago. But he's looking to future generations. And how does he come to us now? Uh, looks ahead to future generations, speaks by teaching and convincing men of the kingdom of God. Convincing, convicting. Such is the bridegroom's coming. So we'll see this all throughout St. Bernard. One of the ways that the Lord comes is when he comes with conviction. <clears throat> when our souls are filled with conviction, when we read the word of God, that, hey, this applies to me. This is something that I'm walking in now, uh, that the Lord has given me. Uh, this is a promise that applies to me. When we have the conviction of being a child of God, that phrasia, right, that beautiful Greek word used in the New Testament, uh, we have assurance of access, you know, through Jesus, Ephesians. Um, that assurance of, is parasia, that conviction of the child of God. That's the Lord coming to us. He looks ahead to future generations, speaks by teaching and convicting men of the kingdom of God. Such is the bridegroom's coming. Right? So when you, you feel that conviction as you read the word of God, it's not just a state of the soul, it's, it's the Lord's presence coming and coming with that grace. Persuading you, convicting you. So to recognize the Lord's presence there and to welcome him. Not just the gifts he, he's bringing of this conviction, uh, but the giver. To recognize the giver of the gift as well as he comes in a greater fullness. Such is the bridegroom's coming. The joys and gifts of salvation come with him. Everything about him exudes delight, re redounds with delectable and health-giving mysteries. And she who loves keeps vigil and watches all this. Happy for her that the Lord finds her watching. He will not pass her by or ignore her. He will stand and speak to her. He will speak words of love. He will speak indeed as the Beloved. Right, how does he speak to us words of love? Uh, through the scriptures often. But these scriptures as piercing your heart. You know, I shared with you about um, the person who felt, you know, Lord, what do you think of me? And what did she hear from the Lord in the depths of her soul? <coughs> my sister, my bride. My sister, my bride. Words of scripture um, addressed to her directly spoken with the power of the Holy Spirit to her as she read the scripture, as she recalled that. That's the Lord coming to her and then speaking this word of love to her. And it's really the Lord present who speaks that word of love to her and to us. A little farther down, paragraph two, uh, she heeded him leaping as he sped along, bounding over the proud, that through lowliness he might draw near to her lowly person. This she observed with the utmost watchfulness. And when he finally stopped and hid behind the wall, she nevertheless recognized his presence and was acutely aware that he was looking through the windows and lattices. Right, so this, this contact with the Lord, like he's hidden, he's hidden behind the wall in this life, behind the veil of faith, yet she still recognizes his presence this shy lover coming to her. And it's love that recognizes his presence, right? The, the beloved disciple in the boat uh, with Peter, they see a man on the, the shore and it's the beloved disciple in love who says, it is the Lord, recognizes his presence through faith behind the widow, windows and lattices. And uh, just to wrap things up for this portion. Um, and we see that um, throughout the sermon too, this gaze of the Lord comes up a lot. It's we gaze at the Lord through the lattices, but he's also gazing upon us. You see the gaze of the Lord, though ever in itself unchanged, does not always produce the same effect. You know, it fills some people with dread, uh, whereas he looks on Mary and fills her with grace. He has looked upon his lowly handmaid. She said, and from this day forward, all generations will call me blessed. These are the words of a happy girl. <laughs> not a one who weeps in dread. Um, yeah, happy girl. Um, Mary receiving uh, the gaze of the Lord. So anyways, we'll see more about the gaze of the Lord as this sermon unfolds. 
Um, but yeah, we have everything uh, kind of here and, and ready to kind of proceed forward. Just contact with the Lord through the lattices, behind the wall, yet we sense his presence in faith. We know he's there in his comings. And to be receptive of him and to be receptive of his gaze of love. Okay, so we'll take our break now and I'll come back and continue. Do I just hit stop? Is that? Yes.